Hello and welcome to today's WCET and WCET State Authorization Network webcast, Data Protection and What Institution Staff Need to Know. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WT WCET. As we go through, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat box. We'll hold questions until we get through the presentations and then we'll be sure to get to those. But if there's several questions that we need to interject and uh, interrupt the speakers to address, we will certainly do so. You should have received the PowerPoint slides via your email with the link to this presentation today. We'll also be sending out any shared resources, a link to the recording and the slides after the live presentation. You can also follow along in the Twitter feed the hashtag is WCET webcast and feel free to pose your questions there as well. I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's moderator, a good friend and colleague of mine, Cheryl Dowd, who is the director of WCET State Authorization Network. Go ahead, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Megan, for introducing us and uh, for uh, setting us up for this webcast for today. Um, I'm very pleased that we're able to um, share two presenters with you. Uh, one of them, SAN members will remember from last year, um, Trina, Tina Rodrig, and uh, also our other presenter is Baron Rodriguez, and uh, Rodriguez, excuse me. So let me tell you a little bit about them. Well, first, uh, I see here, um, the slide before you is about the question box, and that's something that um, Megan addressed just a couple minutes ago. We will address questions at the end of the presentation, there is a question and answer box. You'll see that in your dashboard monitor, the question box, um, and you'll see Q&A will be at the end, but the Q&A box is where you're gonna put your questions in um, for us to address at the end of the presentation. Could you go ahead one more, please, Megan? Here they are. These are our presenters for today. Um, Baron Rodriguez, currently leads the data privacy and security efforts for West Ed, a research-oriented nonprofit organization. His focus is on improving information security best practices for all aspects of an organization's work beyond just the information technology components, such as staff awareness and training, contractual safeguards, and legal considerations. Barron is an expert on FERPA, GDPR, and many other data privacy laws. Prior to joining WestEd, he was the director of the U.S. Department of Education's Privacy Technical Assistance Center and the National Center for Education Statistics State Longitudinal Data, Data Systems Technical Assistance Center. So we're very pleased to have Baron here, and we're very pleased to have back uh, Tina Rodrig. Tina Rodrig was formerly with the Department of Ed in the uh, federal student aid um, area. She is still working with the government, but in a different capacity, which I'll let her share a bit about that. Um, she has worked with a variety of um, other government entities, such as OMB, Department of Homeland Security, Department of State. Um, before she was with Department of Ed, uh, she was the program director for professional services at CypherCloud, uh, where she supervised concurrent teams deploying globally the policy-based on-the-fly encryption product in financial and healthcare environments for data protection and clouds such as Salesforce, Amazon, Google, Dropbox. She, um, she holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin and a master's degree in management information technology from the University of Virginia and is a candidate uh, in the GW University Executive Cyber Core Doctoral Program. Her dissertation uh, quantitatively examines the power and politics of cybersecurity within an organizational environment. We have two wonderful experts today. We're very pleased to have them. Um, we're going to start with uh, with Baron for today. So welcome, Baron. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Megan. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with folks today. Um, so I'm going to kind of ground level set the conversation today because I think sometimes we use a few terms interchangeably, and I, I always like to explain them because sometimes you'll hear me say privacy, sometimes you'll hear me say data security, um, but they are different. So when you think of privacy, it relates to the rights you or others have to control personal information and how it's used. And then when you think of data security, it's on the how information are protected, so personal and other types. 
This concept is going to be really important as we walk through both GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act, because they're truly privacy statutes um, versus um, the data security side of things. Um, whereas GLBA does spend a lot more time on the, the data security as, as, as does HIPAA. So next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the events that have really driven both data security and privacy efforts um, really worldwide. Um, FERPA, there's been many attempts at modernization. Um, it's a very old statute created in 1974 um, and sometimes very difficult to work with uh, in the post-secondary environment. Um, there's been a consumer privacy bill uh, of uh, rights that was, that was uh, started under the Obama administration. Um, there's been a start, stop industry and advocates pushed back quite a bit. Um, but then some interesting things happened that has kind of spurred the conversation as to the need for protecting people's personal information. We're going to go into some of those drivers. But some of the legal side of things um, were when GDPR was, was passed and actually uh, was implemented in uh, this year, uh, but was actually passed a few years ago. And that's really focused on consumer protection. Um, it's not you know, in, in the U.S., we have very sectoral laws that are focused on education, and health privacy, and financial privacy. They don't do that in, in Europe. It's very much consumer-based. California um, passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, and that's the first comprehensive state-based consumer privacy law in the United States. I'm going to go into more of that in just a little bit. 12 states have passed data breach and consumer protection laws, um, and they're more on the financial side of things than some of those states there. Um, on the, the industry side, you can see that Google, AT&T, Amazon, and others released a framework for new privacy laws to get ahead of states potentially passing laws like the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, I'm gonna get into each of these in a little more detail. So what drove this? Well, we all know about the Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytica um, debacle, um, and there's been numerous healthcare breaches. If, if you haven't been part of a healthcare breach, you're part of the precious minority. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, has had um, some, and there's been very, a, a whole variety of, of healthcare type of breaches, tons of financial breaches, everything from credit card companies to large retailers. Ransomware has been um, also uh, of, of interest uh, as of late. And then, of course, the phishing attacks have gotten so sophisticated um, that people have been unknowingly entering credentials and other information that's allowing um, uh, criminals to be able to access information um, with using someone else's credentials or by taking over the person's machine. Next slide. So one of the things on the horizon, um, potentially, is a proposed national privacy framework. This is the one where I talked about Google, AT&T, other tech giants really coming together to try and um, come up with a national framework. So what does this mean? Well, this means that there could be a new privacy law that's driving, um, that's driving our consumer protection laws in the United States. Now, you may say that not a whole lot has necessarily been done on Capitol Hill, and, and one can argue one way or the other there. But I will say that with the, with the tech giants driving this conversation, the thought is that there's a very good possibility that something has passed. Otherwise, states will continue to pass different laws that could inhibit the ability for companies to work state by state. And it also means that you in the post-secondary world may have problems moving data from one state to another. So, a national framework might be a very good approach to deal with a very patchwork privacy type of situation that may be developed should this not happen. So what are some of the things that they talk about? Well, one is um, collection and use of information responsibly, transparency about how data is being used, um, making sure that you maintain the quality of information so that consumers have the ability to change their information. Sounds a lot like FERPA, right? Uh, making it practical for individuals to control the use of their personally identifiable data so they can opt out um, more easily, um, giving individuals the ability to access correct delete and download information that's collected about them, um, including requirements to secure personal information. 
Next slide. Um, and so what it would do is it would hold um, potentially organizations accountable for compliance, um, focus on risk of harm to individuals, uh, distinguish direct services from enterprise services, um, really try to think about um, the, both the, the ability for, for data to move from state to state. So you can see the geographic scope side of things. Um, and then also um, this will allow us to work more seamlessly with, for instance, Brazil's national law, Canadians, privacy laws, and GDPR, for instance. So without this um, transfer of data between the United States and to other countries is difficult as well. Next slide. So the, cons the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, currently, it only applies to for-profits that collect personal information um, and do business in California and have one of the following. So gross revenue is over 25 million. Um, essentially, they're doing business, the business of collecting data to sell to consumers, right? Um, that's so far. Uh, that doesn't mean that this couldn't be broadened or narrowed um, by 2020, when, which is when it's supposed to go into effect. Um, part of the problem is you may work with third parties then uh, in, your, in your contracts or um, in other situations that may be subject to the California Consumer Privacy Act. So you also have to think about third parties that you may pr provide, uh, let's say, directory information to. Next slide. So what's covered? Collection of personal information, sale of personal information, and disclosure of that personal information. Next slide. Um, you have some time to get ready for it. Well, I guess it's only a year now at this point, so it goes to, into effect in 2020. It covers residents of California specifically, um, and there is thought there will be lots of modifications and amendments before 2020. So something you need to stay tuned on um, because it's not, of course, enforced like GDPR. Next slide. So what are some of the potential scenarios for schools? Well, um, study abroad programs and overseas, um, and this California Consumer Privacy Act and or GDPR, these could all be implicated by, by um, uh, at, at, for post-secondary institutions. So you have to think about this. Um, alumni and development offices, um, registrar and student records, online institutions, research centers, vendors. So there's a lot of potential areas that you may have to think about as it relates to um, GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act. Next slide. So under GDPR, what can a student do? Well, they can withdraw consent for processing. They can request a copy of all their data, and this is for European Union citizens. They can request an ability to, to move their data to a different organization. They can request that you delete information that you consider no longer relevant, and they can object to automated decision-making processes such as profiling. Next slide. So on the regulated side, what does that mean to you, right? Um, and I was at a conference recently, a post-secondary conference, where the, the, the conversation was, well, what are they going to do? They can't enforce here in the United States. Um, certainly that is, is something that you can think about, um, and that could be approach that you take. But if, if, you're, if your institution was um, potentially um, fined by, by the European Union or by a country within the European Union, that information is still public. Um, and it could prevent some of your international students from wanting to go there. So I, I don't think that's the, the right approach and the right way to think about it. Instead, because you've got the California Consumer Privacy Act and potential nationally privacy, national privacy legislation, your privacy program should be considering these types of laws coming anyway. So you might as well start down the path of being um, more transparent with your, your um, data security and your protection and use of data. So what they can do. Um, oops, sorry, go back one. Uh, they can um, impose temporary data processing plans. They can require data breach notification. They can suspend um, data flows. So if you have a, a campus, let's say in Spain, um, they could then say that you're no longer allowed to transfer data from the US to that campus in Spain. Um, and they can enforce penalties of 20 million euro or 4% of your annual revenues for non-compliance. Right now, their focus is really on the what I call the big dogs so Google, Facebook, you know, some of the Twitter, some of the, the larger 
companies that collect information. They're, they're not going after small institutions at this point. It doesn't mean there are complaints that are in that process yet at this point. Um, there are hundreds of complaints that are in the process of being reviewed by um, the European Union countries specifically um, right now. Next slide. So on the cybersecurity side, so just like FERPA, GDPR requires organizations to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures. Um, and that means thinking about encryption of personal data at rest, um, ability to ensure ongoing confidentiality, integrity, and availability and resilience of processing systems, the ability to restore and provide access to people's data in a timely manner, um, and of course, to uh, process for testing and evaluating the effectiveness of your privacy and cybersecurity systems. Next slide. Um, there are some requirements, and I've seen a lot of post-secondary institutions including this in their notice in case they have European Union uh, citizens. So you have to provide um, um, your policies and provide uh, students with information including um, your, your retention periods, who you're going to share the data with. So think alumni organizations, third parties, if you're transferring that data internationally. Um, you have to do it in plain language. You can't use those, the legalese um, oftentimes that, that is used in notices. It has to be easy to understand. You have to review it on a regular basis. We recommend at least annually, but we recommend that on the FERPA site as well. Um, and then there's a specific checklist that I provided for, for you in this, in this slide that will give you more specifics. Next slide. The last thing I want to bring up is, is um, whether or not you need a data protection officer or a data privacy officer. Um, if you're an institution that does a lot of research, uh, you do research on, on human subjects on a large scale, um, I would say you really want to consider having a data privacy or data protection officer, a point of contact for breaches, but also for um, updating your privacy policies. Uh, so if you're processing um, data on sensitive categories, for instance, on race, ethnicity, uh, other areas like that, you really need to think about potentially having or designating someone in your organization as being a data protection officer. Um, and even if, if it's not required, so sometimes it's required by GDPR, usually for large research organizations, um, it's still a best practice to have a single point of contact in the event of a breach. With that, I think it's Tina's turn. I just wanted to thank Baron. This is Cheryl. Uh, before Tina starts to to uh, provide her presentation, uh, I'm really glad that Baron could share that. And I wanted to just note to everyone that the slides were written in a way that you can share this kind of information in a variety of lists, so that you can review that with colleagues at your institution. And uh, the uh, tentative deck is located on the SAN website, and we will have the final deck with the recording on the SAN website uh, probably by the beginning of next week. But we really appreciate that. And actually, you'll see with Tina's, um, for her presentation, she gives the same kind of structure that Barron provided. So we really appreciate that Barron's providing such rich information. And so I, I, I thank you for that, Barron, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Tina. Hello and welcome. So thank you for the slide switching the slide. So just full and open disclosure, I, I'm here not as a federal employee, but um, representing myself and any opinions or facts I share are gleaned from other sources than my current federal position. Uh, and all opinions are mine. <laughs> so now that we're done with the I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about the Graham Leaf Bliley Act and uh, the requirements therein. So first thing that most people will discuss is why higher ed cares about this, because they notionally know that this law has more to do with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, so this is an interesting area. The Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Education work very uh, co cohesively together to make sure that they don't step on each other's toes, if you will. So much like how they uh, decided that adherence to FERPA is also adherence to the GLB privacy requirements. Um, FTC is leading a lot of the educational privacy and educational cybersecurity uh, determinations for colleges and universities uh, in the education. And higher education further um, has uh, reinforced 
their uh, area of control in several ways. So first, um, they have uh, ruled along with FTC that higher education institutions that underwrite loans or loan money directly or have anything to do with maintaining accounts to include putting meal money on a student ID all qualifies as creating a financial institution qualification for the school itself. So if you're wondering, well, does any of this apply to me? In most instances, it does, unless you entirely outsource all of that activity, which few if any schools that I know of do. Um, additionally, if you look at your program participation agreement and student aid internet gateway agreement, both specifically cite the GLBA uh, with regard to what standards you should follow and the timeliness of your reports. Um, further, under HEA, there's a pattern of practice of establishing cyber as an administrative capability. And in the last uh, year alone, uh, there have been uh, multiple institutions where they have run into situations where they were not adequately protecting the data. There were multiple breaches and they found their access to the student aid internet gateway suspended. Now, to date, uh, I do not know of any uh, institution that has had their financial aid access permanently disabled. Uh, however, in at least one case, it took more than a year for it to be reinstated. So just know that if you are receiving FAFSA data, that is considered federal data that must be protected, just as you would consumer financial data. And in fact, any of the data that you submit federally, um, once it's submitted, is also considered uh, federal data. And that, so therefore, that includes performative data of the students to anything that you submit to show that they are adhering to the three-legged stool of attending classes, uh, they're getting appropriate grades, and that they're enrolled with sufficient credit hours, or those that's all protected data. Um, you may not notionally think of it as uh, privacy data, but for, for the purposes of GLBA, it is, um, Everything along that line must be protected. Next slide, please. So the safeguards themselves uh, are pretty clear, but they themselves aren't standards. There's no frequency that it's required to do it. There's no uh, uh, level of sufficiency. So it's a, it's a very black and white approach when it comes to that. But that being said, you can just not have it, right? So um, one of the things that you'll see is the institution must have the following. And these are straight out of 16 CFR 314.4B, right? So in terms of, it's straight from the law. So when um, I was working at Federal Student Aid, people would say, well, I have a policy or I have a program, but it's not documented. All of those are insufficient. The, you, you either have it or you don't, right? So if you have not developed, implemented, and maintained a program, and a program means that you have to have the policies, you have to have the procedures, you have to have the, the program staff uh, in place. So similar to an academic program would have a rubric and you would know how you're going to proceed in a given time period, semester, quarter, what have you. Uh, cybersecurity program has to have all these things as well. Um, and the person who uh, is in charge of it also has to be an employee. So you cannot outsource this activity. Uh, and that, that goes to the heart of who on your staff is in charge of this. Um, many times there isn't a formal chief information security officer but there has to be a living person who is actively doing it and, and make sure that when they do it, it is sufficient so that any risks that you've identified are well controlled. And so 
what that further establishes is that you have to do risk assessments and you have to establish controls. And this will be uh, reiterated further on in GLBA. Um, now, all that being said, if you have someone who's in charge of it, making sure that they have enough time in their day, if it is a secondary duty, so that they can do a good job, right? So to put someone in charge of it, say the janitor, he is an employee, but he has no time, he's busy mowing the lawn or what have you, cleaning, cleaning the gutters, uh, that doesn't make sense. That person will not be trained. They do not understand the parameters of what is being required from of them. Uh, and they don't have enough resources in order to either uh, assess the risks, let alone address the risks and establish the appropriate controls. So the best practice here is pretty clear. It has to be someone who knows what they're doing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't put someone um, from your clinical staff in charge of your surgery. You wouldn't want someone who's not a trained professional in charge of your information security. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, however, most people worry, especially financial aid administrators, because they don't have a background in information security. They don't know what all the laws are, and they don't necessarily understand what this means. Um, so suffice to say that if you were to take a three by five card and write information security program on it and put your name on it, you might fulfill the letter of this law, but it's, it would not be sufficient. It certainly wouldn't at all adhere to the spirit of this law. So um, this is something that um, you can either use some of the tools that education provides or uh, you can outsource the assistance in this. But just know that as you move forward, it is inherently your responsibility to take care of all of this. Next slide, please. So part of what we were talking about earlier is assessing risks. So again, the law itself requires that you have to do assessments of reasonably foreseeable internal and external risks. So this gets to the point of how are you getting threat intelligence? Uh, for those of you who are um, from a public school, you can today for free sign up for the multi-state Isaac or MS Isaac, and they will give you threat intelligence. For those of you who are research uh, institutions, you can join the REN Isaac, R E N I S A C, and we can uh, share those links. Um, I don't believe REN Isaac is free, um, but it is certainly better than having a breach. Um, the cybersecurity insurance. Uh, providers uh, do an annual study and worst case scenario uh, the cost to recover from a malicious breach can cost more than 1.6 million dollars per record so whatever small investment you make making sure that you know what those foreseeable risks are uh, is definitely better than even having a single record breach um, if you're not doing these internal self checks or you can get an independent assessment. Independent assessments are typically not free. So it again would require um, an investment. And so you, you just need to establish a schedule so that you know how often you're doing these risk assessments and how often you're uh, correcting or those findings. And then as you move forward, making sure that if you do have, or if you do have an area of risk, whether it be from an internal source such as an employee or an external source, such as a bad guy trying to hack in, uh, that you have the appropriate place in mind. So um, in terms of safeguards, right? So making sure again that you have a schedule, that you have safeguards in place and best practices here are making sure that you are able to um, detect when it, it happens. So either testing your controls and or making sure that you have monitoring is also a requirement. And you would know whether or not you have this today. You would know whether or not you test this and you would know whether or not you have a monitoring 
a plan and approach. Um, so if you look at how you move forward, you also need to make sure that uh, you have an incident management plan and that it's not just your IT staff, that it's uh, holistic across your entire agency to involve all of your executives. Your marketing team needs to know, your president or chancellors need to know, um, everyone involved with a full um, incident or emergency should be also included in this if you have a breach. Um, so that that is part of what is required under GLBA. Um, and uh, as Jeff G just points out, Ren Isaac does have some terrific services uh, and a staggered cost model. So thank you for sharing that, Jeff. Um, Additionally, if you do outsource this or any amount of data that's protected data that should be confidential you know, data, you need to first know that you can't outsource the responsibility. It is always your data. It is always your job to protect it. And therefore, if you have someone who's helping it, it needs to stay as safe as if it never left you, right? So service providers are anyone who can have access to the data. Uh, cloud providers, contractors, third-party servicers, if you use someone to destroy your data, they count. Um, now, there is one way to avoid having, say, your third-party servicers or your cloud providers be considered service providers under this, and that is encryption. If they can, they can store the data, but they can't see the data, and this is the same for your internal staff. If they, if they can get to the store, but they can't unencrypt it, or they can't read it, clear text, then uh, it's already considered safeguarded. So you just need to make sure that you are taking reasonable steps to make sure that it is not only as safe as it never left you, but also as safe as it never left the Department of Education. Um, and so part of the way that you have to do this is by making sure the contract language is well written and that it is enforceable. Um, the other thing is, is the requirements under the uh, SAIG agreement are such that you have to report it immediately. So if your contracts are not written to the levels that you're being held to, um, you are going to have not only a breach, but you're going to fall out of compliance with cyber administrative capabilities. So uh, you don't want to end up like one of those institutions that had their access to the SAIG suspended. Uh, but just make sure that you work with your legal um, to make sure that you have these appropriate measures, that it's held to GLBA, and that any time frames are appropriate to what you're required to do. Um, and last but not least, if there's something that you keep within your hand as your responsibility, please make sure that whoever is in charge of it is doing it. So not only do you need to oversee the service provider, you need to make sure your staff are upholding their end of the bargain. There was a institution um, that narrowly avoided having their access suspended. And what happened was they had had a breach because they left default passwords on. And they sent the contract to the department to say, no, look, we contracted this out, it's great. And within it, they kept the responsibility of security uh, testing, design, and uh, configuration in their hand. Well, when a default password is still in a system three years later, you know, the three things that didn't happen were security design, security configuration, or security testing. So if you put your own people in charge of a group activity, both service providers and your own staff, just making sure that you have uh, more than one set of eyes checking to make sure it's done. And again, that these are trained professionals, it's of critical importance. Uh, next slide, please. Also, as you move forward, uh, especially um, as your uh, institution grows and expands, making sure that your information security program is tested, monitored, but also as you change, as you 
add programs, as you add executives, as you have any sort of divestiture or merger, or anything along that line that has a material impact to your institution, that should be reflected in your information security program. Uh, previously, when I worked at the FSA, we would have a few institutions that had a program, had a person in charge of it, but it hadn't been updated for years. And it, it's the difference between you know, the description of an apple and looking at the institution and seeing applesauce. They, they are related, but they're not the same. Um, so you should make sure that as you move forward, that you are protected against the known foreseeable cyber threats. And some of those that are pretty prevalent today, um, there have already been alerts around um, phishing attacks and stealing credentials to change students' uh, login so they can steal their deposits. But this also happens with faculty and staff uh, logins as well. There was, in fact, uh, one university where all of the faculty and staff uh, got an email saying that they'd each gotten a raise and they had to log into the portal in order to see how much and they dutifully clicked the link provided to go ahead and see how much they got in terms of more money because who doesn't want to raise and unfortunately that university didn't have an employee portal so the bad guys got 200 uh, different credentials now you might be asking yourself well what would they see so what we've seen from the Iranian attacks and others is that there's often a multi-prong approach. So the first thing that they'll go for uh, often uh, are the data about the faculty themselves. So they find out uh, where they live, what they do, what and things like that. And we see a lot of follow-up um, where the the W-2s themselves can be stolen. So they're not always after the students' consumer data. Sometimes they're after the faculty and staff. And so we saw a market increase in people's tax returns being stolen based off of W-2s that were taken from institutions. Additionally, what we've seen is once they get a bite at that apple, they get the W-2, then they come back to see what else they can find. So with the Iranians, a lot of it was intellectual property. They were stealing intellectual property, uh, trillions of dollars worth of uh, patent uh, and other technical data, and then they may come back and get the consumer data. So we support. So the part of the problem is, is that again, if your uh, event, that doesn't mean that it's one and done. They can keep coming back. And then we also saw where they would change other direct deposits where um, sometimes even the institution's uh, relationship with banking was changed. All right, next slide, please. So all of these safeguards are in place to make sure you're safe. So just think about how you're uh, training your employees, how you're training your management staff to make sure your employees are doing the right things. Are your policies up to date? Is your program up to date? Do you even have training? Is anybody trained? Um, it's ironic to me sometimes that education institutions don't have education around this topic. Um, and then if you're looking at your information systems, it's not just a crunchy outside. So many people are using cloud and other technologies. Look at your entire network, software, cloud design, how you transmit, store, dispose of data. What are your risks covering that? Do you ever look at your code to make sure that the products that you have or have been developed safely? Is anything obsolete and still being in use? You know, just think of your data like a river. So wherever it flows, is, is it shored up? Or is it safe? Um, and the best practice as provided by the IRS is that you have two safeguards for any. So we're all very familiar with a clean desk policy and keeping a shade, or, but at any instance, you should have two safeguards, um, whether it's a lock and a key, a guard and a gun, uh, or some other methodology to include administrative, technical, or physical controls, right? Because if you, again, as mentioned earlier, if you can't detect 
a event, you certainly can't prevent it and you can't respond to it. And so it can be a situation where you have an advanced persistent threat that goes on for a long time. So just think about within your own organizations, how do you detect that you're under attack and how do you make sure that you aren't hosting attacks? So there were several instances in the last year where uh, an institution wouldn't just be breached. The bad guys would set, set up shop and they would start using that domain uh, to start hosting other attacks. So then you far, start facing the liability for the damage that they do because you both did not detect and then didn't prevent other attacks. Um, also, as you're pulling these together, making sure that it's not just technology focused, but human system focused, there have been some atrocious cases where uh, employees who had authorized access still misuse the data for terrible reasons, um, both causing physical harm as well as financial harm to the students. So uh, making sure that you know how you're managing the insider threats and access, and then that you have a very clear idea of how you will address it if it happens. Um, and just word to the wise, there were so many institutions when they were originally contacted, at least from my position, who either denied that something was a breach or made sure to say that they weren't responsible. Um, that is not the correct answer. Next slide, please. Because within GLB, it says very clearly that these risk assessments are to prevent any unauthorized disclosure, misuse, alteration, uh, destruction, or other compromise of the material. And we saw a lot of schools that would end up having 50% of their records destroyed by ransomware. And in one instance, it was unrecoverable. They had not done a backup. So as you think about the things that are foreseeable threats, right? Ransomware, phishing attacks, insider threats, these are all things that need to be done. And this is complete alignment with what you should already be doing and also um, that was further forwarded GDPR. Um, so last word, if you even suspect this is happening, I highly recommend that you report it to the Department of Education immediately and then do your uh, investigation and uh, to make sure that you're right. You can always call back and say, you know, we thought it was a breach, but it wasn't. Um, there's been a lot of talk about what is what? What do you mean by suspect or real? The idea is much like if you were having a stroke. Time lost is brain lost, right? When you're in the middle of a breach, especially if it ends up being a massive, multi-level attack, which does happen. Um, the Iranians attacked over a hundred thousand professors and staff because they knew what they wanted in terms of their target, right? The, the quicker you report it to the Department of Education, the faster they'll be able to correlate it and then bring in the appropriate people with guards, badges and guns if necessary. Um, but we all have to work together to make sure that you don't have the security and confidentiality of your student information breached, that you have high degree of confidence in the security integrity against such hazards and that if you do have that problem that you're not causing harm or inconvenience to your students so and that's one of the thing uh, that uh, one of my friends would like to argue well it's to the degree of substantial harm or inconvenience well inconvenience is at the perception of the student and if you can think about what level uh, they start to feel inconvenience. I know that I had discussions where even a five minute delay, especially on the, the finals, would be considered substantial inconvenience. So um, that, that just is something that you should keep top of mind. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of the NIST frameworks, and I'll go quickly through this, um, these slides are all hyperlinked. The National Institute of Standards and Technologies are run by Commerce, and they have standards that are built that you can use them. These are all 100% free, and you can uh, download them and adhere to this, and that will make you all GLBA compliant. Next slide, please. The other way, right. So if you don't know what data security standards are, they have 800-171, and that was actually recommended by Dear Colleague Letter 1612. And if you don't know how to do a data security assessment, they have a guide on that for you. If you don't know how to train your staff, right, they have a, a standard on that. And then, in fact, they even have some free training available through this hyperlink. If you don't know what risks are or how to manage them or how to conduct a risk assessment, there are also guides around that. And if you don't know how to do data security monitoring, there is a published guide. And each of these hyperlinks um, will take you to it. Now, you may want to give this to the person who is most concerned within your organization, but they are all available today. Um, and 800 is about to have a Rev2 in a day. Um, so happy Valentine's from NIST to you. Uh, next slide. So the, just as a summary, this is your to-do list. I won't go over them, but I've essentially touched on each of them. Make sure you have a program. Make sure that it's current. Make sure that it's tested. Make sure that you're doing all of the appropriate things um, for the standards that you have. Uh, on um, ifap.ed.gov, they already have some tools in order for you to forward some of these uh, approaches, uh, specifically the CAT tool and the Institution of Higher Education Compliance Framework. Those are available for you free. Uh, make sure everybody's trained and make sure that your executive team not only is prepared through the to leadership type of top exercises as a kid, but that they also um, are prepared from a response perspective if anything happens. Um, so on that note, I think I, we can turn it over for questions. That was great, Tina. Thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing some of these resources. I put in the chat the um, URL for the MSI SAC and the REN ISAC. And okay. also, uh, Tina mentioned um, the Department of Ed site um, and I have that included in a link that I just put up right now, the WCET Data Protection and Privacy Resources. It's an issue page on the WCET site, and it has uh, that plus other things from the Department of Homeland Security um, so that you have resources to, um, to do assessments, you know, much as Tina described, which I really appreciate it. And uh, could, if you have questions for Tina um, or for Barron, um, you can put them in the question and answer um, place. Um, from the um, from our um, our software here from the dashboard uh, and, we, and they'd be happy to answer the questions we have a few minutes to be able to do that I think one of the things that I have a question for you Tina and Baron is that I know we talked from a real technical aspect but um, you know many in our group are going to be the non-technical staff members and could you address a little bit about um, we, we talked about external threats, but also what kind of internal threats? Are there accidents, the, the, the phishing, the spoofing, et cetera, that leave us vulnerable? Baron, would you like to start? Sure, I can start. Um, well, I mean, um, you know, the, the phishing attempts have gotten good to the point where they play on people's guilt a lot of times. So um, I, I always love the story of, of the one that I got when I was at the U.S. Department of Ed, actually, it said, "You've been go. You just recently went to a website that is um, deemed unacceptable by your management team. Um, click here to provide an explanation right away, or your supervisor will be notified." Even someone like me at that point, I was at the Department of Ed. I was it was lunch. I was looking at news, and I thought, well, maybe one of the news stories was inappropriate. But something made me double check, and I think. That's the kind of culture that you have to build within your institutions is really understanding if something doesn't seem right, it probably isn't right. It's some, you know, rethink the way that you do things. Um, the other piece is thinking about 
um, whether it be um, applications or printers that you buy and things like that. Um, recently was consulting with an organization who was doing secure printing, uh, implementing that, you know, to protect student uh, records and, and health records and things like that. And as they were implementing it, they didn't think about the fact that, that there was a possibility of, of um, the default password, which is an employee ID number, being used as the, 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 the way to release the documents, which is something that was publicly printed. Um, that is something that, you know, every day employees need to think twice about uh, how you secure information, uh, whether it be paper information or whether it be um, electronic information. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, um, so I guess to follow up with that, when we talk about training, we're talking about training not only for our technical staff, but for our non-technical staff and our, um, our senior leaders so that it's the whole community that's trained to be able to, to have um, eyes out and um, be a little bit skeptical, I guess, as Baron just indicated. Is, is, is that kind of the best, best practice there is, is to um, have training from the top down? Yeah, I think just to just to clarify that point, I think I think your your biggest bang for your buck, more than technology, more than firewalls, more than even your IS staff and the, the kinds of things they put in place is awareness by everyday staff. Um, that's usually where the phishing and ransomware attacks come um, get um, propagated. Usually, IS people are going to catch those, and they have their own issues um, with with being secure. But I think. The, 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 the everyday staff member understanding their responsibilities and that data security is not an IS function, it's everybody function. Every employee is responsible for data security in an organization. Oh, that's important. Everybody, yes, that makes sense. Uh, you don't have Just to pile on, if I may. Sure. Um, for, for both questions. If you think about uh, where your greatest risks are, Oftentimes, it's not from people who are intentionally doing um, a, a, a nefarious act. A lot of times, it's negligent or indifferent staff who aren't paying attention to where they're putting the data uh, in terms of uh, putting it on a shared drive and not seeing who's protected. There was one instance where there was a technology transition, and as part of cloud enabling, um, a particular school, they just gave everyone free access to everything without doing any real based controls. Um, and then last but not least, making sure that everybody is aware that not everybody should have access to everything. So if they do find something or they do find a coworker who's emailing things that should not be emailed without encryption, that they get to the point of not feeling like they're um, you know, telling on someone, but that there, it's an opportunity for all, everybody to improve. Um, and I realize that there, in some institutions, there's a real culture of, of blaming the messenger. Um, and that's something that we need to get away from, that it should be more along the lines of, oh, thank God you caught that, and how do we prevent it in the future? That makes sense. I, I, I know some institutions, and, and I'm, I'm available here to, I'm watching the question and answer if anybody wants to add a question, but while I'm waiting for that, let me add another thing. Um, am I accurate in saying that sometimes these uh, breaches into our systems also could have an impact on infrastructure? So it's not only are we protecting data, but we're also for our institutions, we have a concern about ultimately about infrastructure. Would, is, is that a correct direction? Uh, connection. Yeah, I, I'd like to start on that one, Baron, if I may. So part of the struggle is that in a lot of these institutions, if you break into uh, one aspect, whether it's the hospital or uh, the web page, there's not enough segmentation. So they essentially then get full reign and they can have access to anything. So that's why having uh, credentials be compromised is such a big deal because they, you know, if you're, if I was to use a house as a metaphor, they might be breaking into a bedroom, but they're not going to just stay in the bedroom. They're going to explore 
the whole house to see where they can find anything of value, right? So there would there would sometimes be an argument, well, they broke in over there, not over here. Well, unless you have full visibility into exactly where that bad guy went, uh, you don't know. Not only do you not know where they went, but you don't know what kind of um, files they left behind to beacon to allow back access back in again uh, or anything along that line. So um, it can be very daunting, especially if, but it's most impactful if you have an insider who goes astray. Um, so making sure that you have those human controls in place so that if someone starts acting fraudulently, acting strange, um, studies have shown that um, if you have a, that uh, the coworker was the first indication that someone was uh, not performing well and that technical controls only worked uh, four to six percent of the time in that instance. So your insight, your intuition is just as valuable as anything else anyone could stand up. That, that's great. And, and actually, I have one question. So uh, just to try to tee this up, too. Um, after this one question, if Tina and Baron, if you wouldn't mind, uh, like some parting words, perhaps some direction. But I want to get to Yolanda's question here. She asks if you could direct us, <coughs> excuse me, to something in writing that we can show institutions to help explain um, that uh, educational partners, vendors should not be responsible for data security and privacy? So let, let me um, rephrase your question, Yolanda. Your partners are just as uh, critical members of your data and security team, but they're not ultimately responsible, right? They have to do their fair share and support their role but the ultimate responsibility is on, uh, on the institution. So this is covered um, in the 2017 FSA training conference uh, uh, in foreign schools for uh, recording and documentation, and then more recently in uh, uh, FSA training conference 2018. Um, I believe they were sections 2834 and uh, there was one more, and I, I'm blanking on it, but the, the one by OIG, the one by, um, uh, by Linda Wilbanks, and the one by Dan Commons, those are the three. Um, and then there's a, a Dear Colleague letter, 1518, and there is another one, which I believe is 1515. Great. Okay, well, we're we're getting close to the to the end of the time, and I see there is one question here that I'm going to hold on to. So, um, please, dear friend, know that this question is being banked, and I will talk to our um, to our folks uh, to our presenters here to be able to share the uh, an answer for you, and it will be posted. Um, but I want to thank Baron um, Rodriguez and Tina Rodrig uh, for being with us today, and um, just one parting word from each of you and then I'd like to turn it over to um, to Megan and I thank Megan for uh, helping manage this um, presentation today. Baron and uh, Tina, final so word? My, my final word is the risk assessments should be done before the breach. You can't do a risk assessment during a breach investigation. Um, that's the wrong time. Uh, so risk assessments are proactive incident response or during the breach. And you should, the education standard is, if you know or suspect a breach, report immediately. Great, and Baron, final word? Yep, my final words would be um, information security and privacy starts at the staff, um, not within tech, not within outside, even outside assessments where you use, you know, where you do risk assessments. So remember that the most important thing you can do for your organization is build that, that um, mindset of protecting your information assets um, because we're all responsible uh, to protect the assets that we're given, both financial and um, student data.
Great, thank you. Megan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, I think this has been a really wonderful session and thank you all for being here and I'll, I'll let Megan close us out. Great, thank you so much and thank you to our speakers. Thanks to Cheryl for opening up this content to the whole WCET community. We're thrilled that so many of you joined us today. And lastly, I just wanna acknowledge our sponsors that help underwrite much of our programming here at WCET. So hopefully we see you on the next WCET webcast. Thanks all. Have a great day.